Hello and welcome to week five, activity three of the year nine Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde scheme of work. I hope you're all well uh, and that you are ready for another exciting and interesting lesson on Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. So the first activity that I would like you to complete today is just reflecting back over the learning that we've done over the past few days, the past few weeks. Uh, and over the course of the entire year. There are six questions in front of you, uh, two in red from last lesson, two in uh, orange from last week, and two in green from earlier in the year. I'll quickly talk you through those questions before you have a go at them yourselves. So first of all, uh, from last lesson, how would you describe the following elements of the mind? And they are the id, and the superego. The second question from last lesson is how does Stevenson present Hyde through Poole's description of glimpsing him from a distance? Moving on to the questions from last week then, we have uh, up in the top right hand corner there, how does the weather on the way to Dr Jekyll's house reflect the mood at the start of chapter 8? And then down in the bottom left, also from last week, we have how does Stevenson create tension through the reactions of Dr. Jekyll's servants? The final two questions are from earlier in the year and today's poem uh, is Tissue. So the first question is this, how can we interpret the title of the poem Tissue? What does that word mean? Try to discuss two different ways that we can interpret that. And as is tradition, our second earlier in the year question is which poems link well to tissue? For each poem you name, write down the theme that links them. So pause the audio now, have a go at these questions, and once you restart the audio, I'll talk you through some possible answers. Welcome back. So let's go through the answers to these questions. Hopefully you've had a good go at answering each of them, looked back through your notes uh, and just refresh your memories uh, of what uh, all of these answers are. So first of all then, how would you describe the following elements of the mind? Those being the id and the superego. So if you look back at yesterday's notes, uh, you should see that the id is the part of the mind that is selfish, seeks pleasure and is controlled by impulsive behaviour. And that links to the character of Mr Hyde in the novella. If you think about the things that he does, it's all very selfish, it's all very impulsive. A second type of um, element of the mind is the superego. And the superego is the part of the mind concerned with following the rules, making moral decisions and thinking before you act. And in the novella, it's represented by Dr. Jekyll. He is um, a, an upstanding and well-respected member of the community. And you would expect him to do the right things, follow the rules and think before he acts. Our second question from last lesson is, how does Stevenson present Hyde through Poole's description of glimpsing him from a distance? So Stevenson presents Hyde as being like a scared animal. He cries out, and this is a quotation, like a rat and runs away from Poole when he's disturbed. This makes Hyde seem very suspicious. And from his behaviour, we can infer that he's perhaps hiding something himself obviously as a crime uh, as he's committed crime but possibly something else perhaps a more controversial interpretation is that actually we feel quite sympathetic for Hyde uh, in this part of the text because it's clear that he's very scared it's clear that he doesn't want to be found and so depending on your point of view you might feel sorry for him Let's move on to the questions from last week then. So firstly, how does the weather on the way to Dr. Jekyll's house reflect the mood at the start of chapter eight? 
So the weather on Mr. Utterson's trip to Dr. Jekyll's house is wild and windy. Um, the trees are described as lashing against the uh, railings. And this creates an eerie and an extraordinary atmosphere. Clearly, this weather isn't usual. And that is reflected by the extraordinary events that then take place at Dr. Jekyll's house. So the events that are taking place at Dr. Jekyll's house, the mystery that's there, the way that the house uh, servants are acting, all extraordinary. And the weather on the way to Jekyll's house sets us up for that. The next question then from last week is how does Stevenson create tension through the reactions of Dr. Jekyll's servants? So Stevenson creates tension through the actions of Dr. Jekyll's servants by having them act abnormally in the situation that they find themselves in. So obviously they're in a strange situation because their master, Dr. Jekyll, has, has gone missing and their behaviour is quite extreme for them. So first of all, Poole, who's normally a very private man, who keeps Dr. Jekyll's secrets for him, has decided to visit Dr. Uh, Mr. Utterson to open up to him uh, and to bring him to Dr. Jekyll's house to try and unravel the mystery. So for Poole, that's a very unusual set of behaviour which creates tension. We also have the character of the housemaid who, when Dr. Mr. Utterson arrives at the house, is hysterical with fear and she's upset and she's crying. And again, that creates tension because the audience at this point don't know why she's behaving like that. It's very strange for somebody to behave in such an extreme way. The rest of the servants as well are clearly not going about their everyday business. They are sort of standing around, confused, they're unsure what to do. And again, this creates tension because there is clearly something that is stopping them from behaving normally. And we don't know as the reader what that is when Mr. Utterson arrives at the house. OK, let's look at the two questions then from earlier in the year. So firstly, how can we interpret the title of the poem Tissue? Try to discuss two ways. So the title of the poem Tissue could be interpreted as meaning paper, tissue paper, which the poem then goes on to discuss. So the poem discusses maps, books, receipts, all different kinds of paper, of which tissue is one. We could also interpret the word tissue as meaning flesh or skin, and this relates to human beings. So as we read the poem, the dual meaning of the title links to the way that the poet, Darker, discusses the interconnectedness of paper and human lives and how important paper is to our lives as human beings, whether it is in the way of books, maps, receipts, architectural drawings that enable us to build houses and uh, all other types of buildings, this kind of thing. So it's a clever dual meaning that highlights the link between paper and us as human beings. The final question from earlier in the year then is which poems link well to tissue? For each poem you name, write down the theme that links them. So there are a couple of themes that you may have gone with here. First of all, possibly the power of humans. So in tissue, humans have harnessed paper to enable us to do all of these amazing things that we can do in our civilization. And the power of humans is also discussed in Checking Out Me History, both in the way that people try to stop the poet from looking at his history, but also the power that the narrator has to uh, investigate his own history. Uh, Storm on the Island and the power that humans have to protect themselves from the ravages of the storm. And also power of humans in London, where humans have tamed the river and they're inflicting all sorts of terrible pain on one another. You may also have thought about the power of nature. The power of nature occurs in poems like Kamikaze, where 
the kamikaze pilot is inspired by nature to turn his plane around and not complete his mission, even though that means that his family won't speak to him again for the rest of his life. Again, the power of nature appears in storm on the island, with the great storm attacking the human beings living there. And also, we have the power of nature in Ozymandias. So, even though the king, Ozymandias, considers himself to be powerful, over time, nature proves itself to be more powerful than him. It destroys his statue and it destroys his civilization and his empire. So hopefully you have made some extra notes uh, around these questions, anything that you haven't written uh, down yourself. If you uh, have missed anything, just rewind the audio a little bit, listen to uh, my answers again and just make notes of anything that you want to add. Let's move on just to have a look at. So first of all, we have our challenge objective, which is to apply our understanding of Stevenson's presentation of characters in the novella so far. And we also have our Aspire objective, which is to evaluate our analysis of Stevens, Stevenson's language and structural choices. So in this lesson, what we are going to do is focus on the middle section of chapter eight, the last night, sorry, the final section of chapter eight, the last night. So part three, um, we're going to be finding out what happens when Mr. Utterson and Poole break down the door to Dr. Jekyll's laboratory. So in order to do this, you are going to need to read either in your text in front of you or on the online version uh, from the line weeping how that said the lawyer, to the very end of the chapter. Once you've done that, what I would like you to do is look at the six events at the bottom of the screen and place them in the correct order. You're well used to this activity by now. Uh, the first event and the last event have been done for you, so number one and number six are correct. What I would like you to do now then is read through the chapter, have a go at the activity, Pause the audio, and once you resume, I'll take you through what the correct answers are. Welcome back. So hopefully you have had an opportunity to read through the final part of chapter eight, The Last Night, and you've had a go at placing these six events in order. So let's have a look on the next slide order these events occur in. So first of all we have Utterson shouting through the door to warn Dr Jekyll that if he doesn't come out they will break in. Mr Hyde replies begging them not to. So Mr Hyde doesn't want them to break into the study. Number two, Poole breaks down the door with an axe. When the dust settles they see the body of Mr Hyde who has poisoned himself as they broke in. So as they're breaking in, Mr Hyde has taken poison and he's now dead on the floor um, and they cannot question him, they can't uh, take him to the authorities to answer for his crimes. Number three, they search the premises for Dr Jekyll but he's nowhere to be found. Mr Utterson thinks he might have fled but there is no evidence for this. So the room is connected to uh, lots of other rooms and Paul and Mr. Utterson search through all of these rooms to try and find a trace of the missing Dr. Jekyll, either his body or something that tells them what has happened to him, or where he might have gone. But they find absolutely nothing. Number four, they inspect the room and find the remains of an experiment as well as a letter addressed to Mr. Utterson. So as Paul and Mr. Utterson uh, search the laboratory itself, where Mr. Hyde is laid dead on the floor, they find the remains of a mysterious experiment that's clearly half done, and they find a letter to Mr. Utterson, which they decide to open. Number five, the letter contains a new will, 
with Mr. Rutterson named as the inheritor. A note in Dr. Jekyll's handwriting is also there with that day's date on it. So a couple of things here. First of all, if Mr. Utterson is now the inheritor, that means that Dr. Jekyll has written Mr. Hyde out of the will. Mr. Hyde will no longer benefit if Dr. Jekyll is uh, dead or goes missing. So that's quite a significant change to Dr. Jekyll's will. Also, the note in Dr. Jekyll's handwriting, which has that day's date on it, suggests that he was alive on the day they broke into the laboratory, which, when we consider that he went missing eight days before, doesn't seem to make much sense. Finally, then, number six, the note encourages Mr. Utterson to read Dr. Lanyon's account of the story and then Dr. Jekyll's so he can fully understand the mystery he has been trying to unravel. So in this note that Dr. Jekyll has written, apparently on that very day, he encourages Mr. Utterson to read the letter that Dr. Lanyon sent him before he died, which will tell Mr. Utterson uh, Dr. Lanyon's side of the story. And then if he still wants to know the rest, to read Dr. Jekyll's letter fully so that he understands what has been happening with Dr. Jekyll over the course of the story. And those two letters, Dr. Lanyon's letter and then Dr. Jekyll's letter, make up the final two chapters of the novella. Hopefully you got all of those in the correct order using the, uh, using the text as you read through it. What we'll do now is we shall move on look at some of the language uh, that is being used in this um, in this chapter that you may uh, or may not uh, be confident with uh, may need to just uh, go into a little bit more detail on so we have five words on the left hand side we have disinterred from the phrase pool disinterred the axe we have sunder from the phrase the door burst in sunder we have kernels from the phrase, the strong smell of kernels. We have the word blasphemies from the phrase, annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. And then we have uh, cheval glass uh, in the phrase, the searchers came to the cheval glass. So as always on the right hand side, we have the steps that you would normally in a lesson take if you didn't understand a word that was in a story in front of you. Now obviously we're not in a normal lesson uh, and you don't have access to uh, things like a face partner uh, or a shoulder partner but you do have access to hopefully dictionaries and possibly uh, you can look online and google some of these words. So I'm going to leave you for a few minutes now to have a go at this activity, pause the audio and resume it when you are ready to hear me talk through what these words mean. OK, welcome back. So let's talk through these uh, these words that I've picked out from the end of chapter eight as being ones that you may need explaining in a bit more detail. Of course, there may be other words that I haven't picked out uh, that you um, might need to look up yourselves that's absolutely fine of course that extra work will only help you when it comes to um, understanding the text and also answering the questions that we're asking you now but also in your GCSE years in year 10 and 11 so make sure you do that extra work if you need to the first word we've got then is disinterred in the phrase pool disinterred the axe now disinterred means to dig something uh, up that has been buried and is usually used um, to describe digging up a body. Now this strikes us as an unusual word choice when talking about an axe but actually it perhaps alludes to the death of Mr Hyde which is about to follow. So the idea that the axe has to be um, not dug up because it isn't buried but it has to be disinterred from where it is um, currently living perhaps suggests uh, that semantic field of death 
and just prepares us for the possibility that somebody is about to die. Our second word then is sunder. Now this is quite a, an old fashioned word that isn't used um, very commonly anymore and it means to split apart. Um, so Stevenson uses the word to show that the door uh, splits apart under the attack from Poole and the axe and allows them inside. So the door doesn't swing open, Poole actually smashes through the middle of it. Our next word is kernels um, from the phrase the strong smell of kernels. Now kernels are the seeds inside uh, fruits and nuts which sounds strange. Why is Mr Utterson talking about being able to smell seeds as he walks into uh, the room? However what we need to understand is that the seeds inside fruit and nuts are a source of cyanide which is a really deadly and fast acting poison which can kill in seconds in high enough doses. So as he walks through the door and he smells kernels, these seeds, he realises that that is possibly the way that Mr Hyde has killed himself. So as they've started to break through the door, Mr Hyde has taken some cyanide and that has killed him very, very quickly. Our next word is blasphemies from the phrase annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. Um, now again blasphemies is, is quite an old-fashioned word and it's heavily to do with religion particularly the offense of speaking about God in a negative way. So if you say something bad about God you are being blasphemous. Now in Victorian England Blasphemy was a much more serious matter than it is today. Because we're a less religious society, it doesn't have quite the same severity that uh, it would have had in Victorian England. Dr Jekyll would not be expected to speak against God as a respectable member of society. Okay, So the fact that he's sat there and he's written in this book these blasphemies against God, these things that are... Um, against God is quite surprising, quite shocking to Mr Utterson when he sees them. Finally then we have cheval glass. Now a cheval glass is a mirror that's fitted by the centre of it so that it can be tilted. So you may have one of these in your house somewhere, you may have seen one of these. It's a big long mirror and it's fitted in the middle um, on a hinge so that you can swing it around, tilt it up and down. When Mr Utterson and Poole get into the room, the mirror is tilted upwards towards the ceiling. So you can't stand in front of it and look at yourself. So there's a question there. Why is it tilted towards the ceiling? Is it because Mr Hyde didn't want to see himself? And if Mr Hyde didn't want to see himself, why didn't he want to see himself? An important question that we should be thinking about uh, as we start to read the final two chapters. So hopefully that's cleared up some of the language for you and you now have a bit of a better understanding of why Stevenson chose to use these particular words at the end of this chapter. bit of extract analysis. It's only a short piece of extract analysis today. Um, on the right hand side is the extract that I want you to read through and answer a question on. I'll quickly just read through the question. Uh, so that is, how does Stevenson use language to describe Mr Hyde in this extract? Uh, and then, as always, I've left you with some uh, steps that will help you answer the question. So, number one, make sure you read the question and you highlight the key words so you know exactly what it is you're meant to be writing about. Number two, select four pieces of evidence related to the focus of the question and highlight each piece of evidence. Now, because this is only a short extract, you may not be able to find four pieces of evidence, but find as many as you can. So maybe two, maybe three. Number three, circle a key word or phrase in each piece of evidence you've selected and look out for those aphorist techniques. 
Once you've done that, number four, uh, um, label the language technique. So if it's a simile, label that up. That helps you to remember when you are writing exactly what it is you're going to be writing about. Because sometimes between finding the evidence and writing about the evidence, you might forget things. And then step number five, write your four developed paragraphs to answer the question. Now, if you've only been able to pick out a couple of pieces of evidence, obviously you'll only be able to write a couple of paragraphs. The sentences that I've given you follow the peel structure. So sentence one is your answering the question, which is your point. Sentence two is using your evidence, which is obviously the first E, the evidence part of your peel paragraph. Sentences three and four are a little bit more uh, in depth in terms of the second E, the explanation in your peel paragraph. But in those sentences, you need to pick out a keyword and explain what you understand it to normally mean, and then explain what the keyword means in this text. Why has Stevenson chosen to use it here? And then finally, sentence five is your linking sentence, the L in your peel paragraphs. And that is explain the link between this keyword and others in the extract. So I'll give you a minute or two to read through the extracts and write a paragraph or two about how Stevenson uses language to describe Mr Hyde. Once you've done that, I will take you through an example paragraph that uh, will hopefully um, be similar to the ones that you have written. So pause the audio now, have a go at the activity. If you are struggling, listen to the next part because there will be an example paragraph there that will help you with some ideas. Okay, welcome back or welcome along if you are uh, listening to this in order to get yourself some ideas. So I've written uh, an exemplar paragraph in answer to this question. If you, um, if, if this paragraph has something in there that you perhaps haven't written about, then feel free to pause the audio and to rewind it and listen again and write down anything that you haven't already written down. So this is the paragraph that I have uh, written in relation to uh, this extract and answering the question, how does Stevenson use language to describe Mr. Hyde in this extract? So Stevenson uses language to describe Mr. Hyde as a violent man who has turned his violence upon himself. He writes that Mr. Utterson knew he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. This tells us that Mr. Hyde has killed himself in desperation, trying to avoid getting caught or captured for the crimes he has committed. The phrase self-destroyer emphasises the violence and the finality of the act of suicide and reflects the Victorian view that killing yourself was a sin against God. This phrase links to the violent, painful images from the beginning of the extract, where Hyde's body is contorted and still twitching. Now, as you can see there, I've answered the question, I've used evidence, I've picked out a key uh, word or phrase and um, explained what it means and then explained the link between that word and others in the text. So hopefully your paragraphs are something similar. With my paragraph, I might have gone into the word destroy a little bit more uh, because it's quite an interesting word. It has lots of connotations, but that's definitely an area for improvement next time. I write a paragraph analysing language. Have a reflection, have a think, what could you do better next time? Okay, let's move on to the final slide. Plenary. So after this chapter, we are moving on to Dr. Lanyon's account of his side of the story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr Hyde. So I want you to be thinking, what do you think Dr Lanyon will have talked about in his account, in his letter, 
in his trip to Dr. Jekyll's house. If you remember from an earlier chapter, when Mr. Utterson visits Dr. Lanyon, he finds that Dr. Lanyon has been scared pretty much to death by something that he's seen at Dr. Jekyll's. So we need to uh, be thinking and be predicting what it is that uh, scared him so much. What I'd also like you to think about is how this letter from Dr. Lanyon will help Mr. Utterson understand the mysterious events that have been occurring. What information will Mr. Utterson learn that will help him understand the strange things that have been going on? So have a think about those things prior to uh, the next lesson. And I hope that you found this lesson useful. Until the next time that we uh, reconvene to go through the next part of Mr. Jekyll, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I hope you stay well. I hope you stay safe. Uh, look after yourselves and the people that you love. Thank you.